From the years 1930 to 1967, filmmaker Mikio Naruse directed 89 films. Two in the Shadow was his swan song. Two in the Shadow is perhaps more commonly known in English by the title of Scattered Clouds. Naruse is widely acclaimed as one of the major figures in the history of Japanese cinema. Younger, edgier cinephiles were keen to pronounce his catalogue superior to that of Yasujiro Ozu. I don't agree or disagree with that sentiment, although it was easy to understand why such a belief, forced or otherwise, would flourish. Naruse's cinema remains evocative, his realised sensitivity is enrapturing, and makes for a beautifully enunciated dramatic library. Naruse lingers on a moment, conjuring its majesty, or lack thereof, with refined taste. He never indulges in extravagance or unorthodoxy when filming his players. Much of Naruse's films are reliant on the successful photographing of his players and the dynamics within a space, and rarely, if ever, is a scene's intent undefined, even when his players' motivations are strange or unclear. Especially prominent in this film, the tone of a moment is communicated with fluency and grace. I found his handling of space particularly striking within Two in the Shadow, and I'll elaborate more so later. I feel as though this distinctiveness is motivated by a sincere concern of Neruse's. I have seen countless Japanese dramas of the mid-20th century and explored the catalogues of other great, or sometimes great, drama dramatist auteurs in a manner similar to my survey of Neruse's. I do note a particular sophistication in Neruse's work. Aside from his cast seeming generally stronger, Neruse then extrapolates the juice of a scene through very considered blocking, close-ups, and infrequent zoom will pan and, and edits across angles within the space. His interior dialogue scenes are expertly crafted, clearly well staged and extremely well performed. His placement of camera, his specific framing, every shot displays the current vector of the scene, no dialogue in is a flat, free angle affair. Traditionally one imagines a director to read some script, set the players, stage the room and place their cameras. Neruse must have done the same. Although some of the choices of angles, within Two in the Shadow certainly, suggest the regular remaneuvering of film cameras between lines of dialogue amongst the same scene, we move from one shot to the next within the same room, briefly impressed as we consider, hey, I've had to have moved the camera there after filming the previous shot, otherwise it would have been visible. This might be considered a minor trivial point, but given how many flat, unangled, squarely staged Japanese dramas I have consumed, this sort of thing is very exciting for me, and it makes one of the most articulate and satisfying aesthetics possible within the framing of an interior drama scene. So the plot of Two in the Shadow follows the extended aftermath of a fatal car accident. Yumiko's husband, Hiroshi, is accidentally hit by Shiro after his vehicle swerves out of his control. Yumiko is completely shattered. She was planning to have a child with Hiroshi, and they were even planning on emigrating to America. Both of these are so tragically halted. Shiro is acquitted by a court as it is determined that his vehicle had unexpectedly malfunctioned regardless and with no discernible fault from its driver. As a result, Shiro is not legally expected to pay compensation to the widow. However, Shiro is exceptionally devastated and offers to pay monthly sums to Yumiko in order to both help ease his conscience and to assist her financially. Yumiko is hesitant. She wants absolutely nothing to do with this man, the man who ruined her once beautiful life. Although when Hiroshi's family cuts her off financially, she ultimately relents. This meager financial assistance is unfortunately not sufficient for Yumiko, and so she relocates to her hometown, assisting her sister Ayako at an inn she runs nearby Lake Tawada. And now, this sounds maybe somewhat, well, wholly melodramatic on paper, and maybe it does be described verbally as well. But Shiro is reassigned by his employers to the same area. So the two are unexpectedly reunited, and as challenging emotions run rampant, they form a relationship. In another film, their near-climactic climactic kiss would have been showered with music, close-ups, intensive lights, and or sentiment, positive or negative. In Naruse, the camera mutely cuts back from the instinctual close-up. They close their kiss, framed amongst the wider area of the room. Yumiko lightly pulls back and walks away, head hanging low, her face a small corner of the wider frame. Naruse fa flavors this moment appropriately, knowing the subsequent events he intends to renounce, let alone the narrative's conclusion. He colors these moments with every consideration of his foresight. In this case, he has literally colored these moments with such a consideration in mind. Something about this entire film's lightly saturated color photography, expressive and romanticizing, seems to support the suggestion that a godlike fate twists these characters into psychological extremes, teaching lessons of most painful insight into the capacity of the emotional palette. Fate or Naruse, treats its characters, treats their characters as lab rats. The narrative extremes, say, the melodrama, 
are controlled environments for the creation of complex and challenging passions, surely not the content a symmetrical narrative, surely not the content of a symmetrical narrative current, uh, but alas, the eventual consequences are narratively apt, as a fatefully inclined god or film auteur inevitably ensures. But yes, I really love this film. This might very well be my favourite Mikio Nerus favorite from Mikio Neruse overall. I just found the direction in this film, the edits, the camera placements, the subtly saturated images and its lively locations. They all serve to craft an evocative experience, extreme in certain respects, but it feels so vigorous and lived in. 1960s Japan is wonderfully illustrated, cities decorated with Coca-Cola advertising, the elegance of urban gardens. It is one perspective's modernist paradise and another perspective's cultural decline. Slightly melodramatic as I had claimed, though it, it serves a powerful purpose here, I, I would insist. The film dwells in the extremes of human responses to circumstances, finally it whimpers away, as unrealized expectation softly slaughters the purported, the purported pur promise of extravagance which melodrama is perhaps prone. The relationship of Yumiko and Shiro may be the hand of fate, but for whatever intent it certainly was not blissful paradise. It is not Shiro she wants, but someone. In turn, it is not Yumiko that Shiro wants, but a final atonement. Sadly, romance could not cure the grief of either player, an improper substitute for solace. Hiroshi is dead, Yumiko lives a widow, and Shiro lives with shame. Fate ensures that the two ought not be... ought not be. It's a beautiful tragedy, but one which feels like a psychological hypothesis. Not a strict study of human potential, but of what cinema can communicate about the depths of its players' emotional and psychological capacities. And so I consider this one of the most effective and affecting film dramas I have ever witnessed. It winds up dwelling on complex subject matter, though ensuring its digestibility through successful narrative filmmaking. I have hinted before at how some how cinema dramas rarely tend to impress me significantly, or that there are quite few great or even interesting film dramas throughout cinema history. What I mean when I say this, and where I'm coming from, is that I very generally do not care about a film story. It's almost the last reason I watch a film. Fundamentally, and every single film consumer will agree, it is the telling of the story which proclaims a good, it a good story, and doubly so for cinema, regardless of whether the telling is in a style appreciated by a viewer or not. That would be ultimately a subjective matter. And so if I'm watching a film drama, and most film dramas are simply churned out for those who are too lazy to read books and so just need to consume something with a degree of narrative familiarity, well, it better rise above and beyond for me, narratively, thematically, cinematically, whatever it might take. I mean, sometimes a drama can be tremendously successful without being utterly aesthetically spellbinding or thematically intricate. Observe my film of the day regarding 1967's The Guest Who Came In on the Last Train. That film I could barely talk about for three minutes because, well, it is an effective drama. It is a fine plot synopsis, it is spectacularly acted, and very well staged. Seemingly, uh, seemingly effortless, but clearly not, given how many film dramas I find wasteful and uninteresting, I mean. The Guest Who Came In on the Last Train is a modestly wonderful film without inspiring much elaborate conversation. It pulls its punches, it serves its function, kept me consistently engaged while striking me with fevered drama, it subsequently holds a glowing place in my film memory. But still, how much can you say about a film like so? Yeah, it's good, got the job done, every aspect pulled off perfectly, I loved it, would recommend it. What else can you really say there? And then there are dramas such as Two in the Shadow, where a master auteur like Neruse conjures his abilities to consider these elaborate contrivances, testing his talents, his cinematic articulation, seeking to commune such difficult and perplexing emotive worlds. Here I wind up with plenty to talk about, and hopefully some of it of minor value. As I claimed earlier, this may be the apothesis of his of Mikio Neruse's immaculate film career.